Good morning or good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's program, Troubleshooting Tools to Analyze High CPU Utilization Issues on Cisco Catalyst 6500 Series Switches. We're glad to have you with us. A few housekeeping notes to begin. As you entered the WebEx console, you either joined us by audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. Because of our large audience in attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the WebEx Q&A panel as you think of them. You can find the Q&A panel in the bottom right-hand corner of the console. Please leave the WebEx chat window for communication to our WebEx facilitators for any problems or issues you may be experiencing. We would appreciate your input regarding today's webcast, and a short survey will appear when you close your browser at the end of the event. At this time, I'll pass it over to our host for today, Satish Chandran. Satish? Thank you, Ria. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Today, we present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast. During our event today, our topic will be troubleshooting tools to analyze high CPU utilization issues on Cisco Catalyst 6500 series switches. My name is Satish Chandran, and I'm the Business Operations Manager for the Cisco Support Community here at Cisco. Our expert joining me today is Sovik Ghosh, a senior customer support engineer based in India with broad experience in land switching technologies. Welcome, Sovik. Hello, everyone, and I'm glad to present this session to you guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Now, I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Expert Series webcast. Sovik will start with a short presentation on troubleshooting tools to analyze high CPU utilization issues on 6500 series switches for the first 45 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submission for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may submit a question to be answered by Sovik and a team of Cisco technical experts using the Q&A panel, which is on the right-hand side of the console. The team of technical experts is well-versed in land switching technologies, so please begin posting your questions now to give us the best chance of answering them. And if you experience any technical issues, please post your questions in the chat window. That is also on the right-hand side of the window. And uh, we'll be asking polling questions during this webcast, and we encourage you to participate by answering them. You may download a PDF copy of today's presentation using the link that will be posted in the chat window shortly. And you can see that is on, also on the slide. Now let's get started with today's event. So let's start with a polling question for the audience. The question is, what is your level of experience in troubleshooting high CPU utilization on 6500 switches? A, I have seen the 6500 switch, but rarely work with it for troubleshooting purpose. Option B, I know basic 6500 troubleshooting, but no idea about how high CPU utilization specific troubleshooting. And option C is, I know most of the 6500 concepts and know what to collect and when. The poll is activated on the right hand side on the polling tab. Please take a moment to answer, and this will give Sovik an opportunity to tailor his presentation to your needs. And also make sure to submit your questions as uh, Sovik will present. He will be answering them later in the webcast. Also, the answers will come from the technical panelists that are online. Now I'd like to hand over the mic to Sovik, who will give you an expert look into the topic. Sovik, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Uh, my name is Sovik Ghosh, and I'm a technical su customer support engineer working with Cisco TAC land switching team for three and a half years now. And along with me, I have a team of three engineers, Amit Singh, Akshay Balagan, and Ranganath Raju, who has helped me to prepare the presentation, and will also be helping you to answer your questions should you have any during the time of the presentation. All right. <clears throat> so let's see what is our agenda for today. Now, in the first few slides, what we're going to look at is how to spot a CPU utilization issue and when to qualify a CPU spike to be an issue. Then finally, we, what we're going to look at is the architecture of a SOUP 720. And we will also talk about a general supervisor architecture, which we have in a Cattle 6500 switch. Then we'll look into the life cycle of a packet inside the switch and when a packet will be processed by the switch, by the CPU. 
And finally, we'll look into the inspection tools and what are the different tools which are available to us in order to uh, troubleshoot a high CPU utilization issues. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about the different setups like SOUP1 or SOUP2 running in a hybrid mode, a SOUP2 running in a native mode, and SOUP720, which is again running in a native mode. Finally, we'll summarize the presentation with a sequence of events or a sequence of steps which you need to do to troubleshoot or start troubleshooting a high CPU utilization issue. All right, <clears throat> how to spot a CPU utilization problem? Now, whenever, whenever we are talking about a CPU issue, it's mostly related with some kind of control plane protocols, like EIGRP or OSPF or HSRP. So in case you see that any of this protocol, any one of this protocol is having some problem, or you see that HSRP neighborship is flapping or EIGRP neighborship is flapping, then that is probably a cause of, or you know, that, that can be caused by a high CPU, CPU problem. Now again, it's important for us to understand whether all CPU spike is a problem or not. Now, all CPU sp spikes are not a problem, but only if you see a sustained CPU utilization of around 60 to 70 percent, that can be considered as a problem, and we need to troubleshoot that problem. Okay, all right, so what is the first step in troubleshooting high CPU issue? What is that, what is the first command which you're gonna type? Obviously, the command which is there on your screen, show proc CPU or show proc CPU sorted. Now, looking at this output, what are, what are the different fields which you can explore and what is the meaning of each field here? The first field which I'm going to look at is CPU utilization for five seconds. Well, in this case, it's pretty high. It's around 100%. The total CPU utilization, the one which is marked in orange, is the total CPU utilization. And the one which is marked in purple is my CPU utilization due to interrupt switching. Now this gives us an opportunity to talk about what are the different kinds of CPU utilization issues. Now there could be mainly two kinds of CPU utilization problem. One, CPU utilization problem because of process switching. Second, CPU utilization because of interrupt switching. Now, what is CPU utilization because of process switching? Now, if you look at the show proc CPU output, you will see there are different processes which are also using the CPU, uh, CPU cycles. Like in this example, in this output, I have ARP input, which is consuming around 16.62% of my CPU cycle. So it could be an EIGRP process which is consuming the CPU. It could be um, an OSPF process in the CPU or it could be the CDB protocol process. So these are the iOS processes which are mainly using the CPU. Now the question is, what is interrupt switching then? Now ideally what happens is in a 6500 uh, switch which is running in the production, you should not process the packets, the normal data packets I mean, uh, in, the, in the CPU. There is a dedicated hardware which is there to do the processing. We'll see shortly how that uh, hardware is doing the switching and where it is present in the architecture design. But the normal data packet should not ever go to the CPU. Now in case there is some packet which are leaked to the CPU and CPU is, has, is processing those data packet, that is the time when we'll see that CPU utilization is there for interrupt switching. That is interrupting the, uh, the CPU cycles to get processed. Now in this example, as I said, 82% is my interrupt switching or, uh, or CPU utilization used by interrupt switching. And 100 minus 82 is my process switching. Okay, so what is the next command which I'll be interested in? Obviously, show proc CPU history or show process CPU history. So what is this, what is this command giving us? What, what information this command is giving us? Well, if you look at this graph, this is the CPU statistics for last 60 minutes. We can get an idea at what time the CPU problem actually started. Then we can correlate back and see whether, you know, if you have seen an OSP process which, which flapped, whether it's related with the CPU utilization problem or not. So this is an indication when the problem started and how long the problem existed. Now, as I mentioned in my first slide, 
if you see a graph like this, a co constant CPU utilization of 100% or 80%, that is a problem. However, if you look at the next slide, we see a spike in the CPU. This is probably not a problem. The question is why this is not a problem. Now, it is very much possible that when we see a spike in the CPU, that there is some kind of SNMP pooling which is happening in the network, or there is a backup which is going on in the network. Now, the CPU is capable of handling this much of traffic. So in case you see an intermittent spike like this, then that is not a matter of concern, and that's something which we need not troubleshoot. However, if you see a CPU utilization, as we have seen in the last slide, that's the time when we need to be concerned and find out what's happening with CPU utilization. Okay, all right. So what are the different causes for punting traffic to the CPU? Now in this slide, I want to take a moment and uh, find or explore what is our objective in delivering this webcast. In this webcast, as the title says, we are going to talk about the different tools which are available in troubleshooting CPU issues. We will see how do we capture packets which are CPU bound. However, the exact cause of trouble or, or you know or the reason behind that CPU punt is something which we are not going to explore. There can be a lot of there can be a lot of scenarios because of which packet will be punted to the CPU. I have listed the most frequent cause in this slide. However, there could be some causes which are platform specific. So we have deliberately refrained from exploring those options, and we would rec recommend that you go ahead and open a tag case in case you you are not able to derive um, what is the exact cause of the problem from this list. Okay, moving ahead. We'll start with the SOUP 720 architecture here, and we'll see what are the different components which are present in a SOUP 720 architecture. So what I have here is a block diagram of a SOUP 720 architecture, and we'll see what are the different components in this SOUP 720 super, uh, in, in this architecture. Okay, the first thing which I want to mention here is this green block on the top right-hand corner of your screen. This is called the MSFC data card. And inside the MSFC data card, I have two CPUs. The RP CPU, which stands for Route Processor CPU, and the SP CPU, which stands for the Switch Processor CPU. The RP CPU is responsible for doing all the layer three functionalities like maintaining HSRP protocol, building up the routing table, and stuff like that. Whereas the SP CPU is mostly related with layer two functionalities, which would be um, maintaining spanning tree states, maintaining CDP states, and stuff like that. So this is the block diagram which talks about the location of the CPU in the supervisor. And what we have on our left is the PFC data card, which is nothing but a hardware accelerated engine. Inside the PFC data card, I have a similar layer two and a layer three engine. So what happens is when my RP CPU and SP CPU is done with building the control plane protocols, then the entire information will be downloaded onto this L2 or L3 engine. Now when a packet comes inside the switch, first the packet will be processed by this PFC engine here. And inside this PFC engine, I have this QoS TCAM, the fifth TCAM. So basically what I have inside this PFC is I have a dedicated ASIC which are doing a particular functionality. So obviously the switching is much faster as compared to switching by the CPUs here. So when a packet first comes into the switch, what we'll try to do is we'll try to process the packet inside this PFC data card. And in case this PFC data card is not able to process the packet, that is the time when there will be a punch to the CPU. So usually in a production network, when you have all your network protocols converged, your HSRP is working fine, your OSPF is working fine, then all the traffic should be passed through this PFC engine only. And you'll see a CPU utilization of around zero to 10 percent, depending on the benchmark of your network for this RP or the SP CPU. Okay, all right. 
Now, it is also possible that I have the same PFC block diagram, which I've shown in my last slide, on the line card itself. So when we have a line card which has a local PFC in it, we call them as DFC line card. And this is something, this kind of switching is called a distributed forwarding decision or distributed switching. So when a packet comes into the system through one ingress line card, it doesn't have to really go to the supervisor to find out what's going to be my exit port. It can be locally switched or the decision on the packet can be locally taken and the line card itself has the capability to tell the, to tell the packet what's going to be my exit interface. Now let's have a look at what's the uh, life cycle of a packet inside the system. Okay, so what I have here is uh, the line card. When a packet comes into the ingress, ingress line card, the entire packet will be buffered in the ingress ASIC. And only a label which is created from the header of the packet and which will contain information like my source IP, the destination IP, the source VLAN, the, destination, the, the, the source MAC, the destination MAC, will be sent towards my Superman layer 2 or Tyco layer 3 engine. This is basically the PFC over the backplane, which is my bus here. So it will do a lookup on the packet, and in the meantime, the entire packet is sitting in the ingress line card, the ASIC of the ingress line card. So the header goes to the PFC engine. The PFC does a lookup on the packet and sends the result back to the ingress line card through another bus. The result will be a, a drop. It could be just go ahead and drop the packet, or it could come back with a result saying, you need to send out this packet through this specific interface, let's say five slash one. Now there can also be one more result saying that I am not able to process the packet. Please send it towards the CPU. So the idea is just, the, uh, this is the point which I want to focus here that in a normal 6500 running a SOUP 6, uh, 720 or any SOUP, we should not see any package, data package going to the RP or the SP CPU unless and until there is a special attribute in the packet which is making that punt towards my CPU. Okay, so this idea is generic to all catalyst switches. We have a hardware accelerated engine in a Catalyst 3750, in a Catalyst 4500, and as you know, it's there in 6500 as well. So that is probably the reason you will see that uh, the Catalyst switches are costlier than their router co counterpart. Since we have an accelerated hardware accelerator engine there, the packet processing is much faster as compared to the router. Okay, so moving ahead, we have a polling question here and I'll let Satish to take over this question. Satish, please go ahead. Thank you. So before we get back to the presentation, I'd like to take a moment to ask uh, the second polling question. The question is, what is the first thing you do when you encounter issues with high CPU utilization on the switch 6500? Option A, try to understand the problem yourself or search using Google. Option B, ask for help from a 6500 series uh, switch expert in your, uh, from your group. Option C, look at the show tech output and alarms. Option D, just simply go ahead and open a tag case with Cisco. So please uh, post your option, whichever you think you'll be doing when you encounter. Thank you. Over to Shavik. Yeah, I'll just take a minute here because I'm really interested to know uh, the result of this particular polling question. So I'll take one more minute here. Okay. All right. So we got some interesting, interesting results here. Okay. Try to understand the problem by doing some Google. That's, that's good enough. That's, that's exactly our intention. So I believe after this session, the uh, gentlemen who have chosen option A will have more understanding about what outputs to collect. And that's going to be our next session. So in our next session, we'll start exploring 
uh, what are the different tools which are available on different kinds of setup. And this is the lab which I have. Uh, I have three 6500 switches which are running different kinds of soup. I have a soup 720, which is running uh, one of the latest code, SXJ code. And then I have a soup 2, which is running the native iOS. And we have a soup 1, which is running in hybrid mode. So most of you, I believe, I believe that you know that in hybrid mode, we run a CatOS software on the SP CPU and uh, iOS software on the RP CPU. OK, all right. So let's go ahead and see uh, the CLI of the switches now. OK, so this is my Soup 720. Uh, let me show you the version of the code which this Soup is running. I'll maximize the screen so that we can have a look, better look at the uh, devices. So Soup 720 is running SXJI image, 12.233 SXJI. OK, let's see what is the uh, iOS which we're running on Soup 2 native. Okay, so this is running 12.123e4, pretty old iOS. Okay, all right. So this is my Soup 1 hybrid setup. So inside the Soup 1, I have a MSFC 2. This MSFC 2 is providing the layer 3 functionality for the switch. So in case you do not have a MSFC 2, in that case, the Soup 1 will act as a layer 2 switch. OK, all right. So we'll start with uh, looking at the tools which are available for my Soup 1 hybrid setup. Now inside Soup 1 hybrid setup, as you can see that I, I, I talked about this MSFC2, which is providing the layer 3 functionality. And there is a way to log into the device. Now I've connected to this device by, via console. So in order to go into the RP side, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to type switch console. And I'm here at the RP side. So let's check what's the version of the code which I'm running on the RP side. 12.127BE2. OK, all right, great. So let's see what's the current processor utilization. OK, sure enough. So it's 0, 0. So I'm not using this the CP of this box at all. Let me try to do this. Let me try to. Um, spike up the CPU utilization for this particular switch. Now, how, how can I do that? So in order to do that, uh, what I've done here is I've created interface VLAN 10 on all these three switches. Let me show you the IP addresses which I've assigned for interface VLAN 10. So SOUP 720 is assigned with an IP of 10.10.1 .10 subnet mask 24. SOUP 1 hybrid is assigned with an IP address of dot two ten dot ten dot ten dot two, and obviously this is having an IP address of ten dot ten dot one dot three. Now what I can do here is I can simply send some ping towards this VLAN ten IP address from the other two switches, and I I, I believe that there will be some increase in the CPU utilization since the ping to the IP address of the switch are meant for the switch it will be punted towards my CPU. Because I have to reply back to the pings, and the reply can only be generated by a processor. So it will be directed towards my RP CPU. OK, so let me send some ping from here, from Soup 720 native. And from here as well. All right. Now let's see what's the CPU utilization for this switch now. Sure enough, so we see some spike in the CPU. And interestingly, the total CPU utilization is 15%, and interrupt switching is 7%. So as I said in, in the beginning, that, uh, the CPU cycle used by process switching is 15 minus 7, which is 8%. Now, it would be really interesting to understand what process is consuming the CPU cycles. So let's see whether we can find that out or not. So
So this command will give me all the outputs which doesn't have a 00, zero in it. It excludes 0.00. .00. Okay, so what I see here is the IP input is the process which is involved in this case. Now this IP input is again a process which is used for sending packets towards my CPU. So there is one process which is contributing and there is one interrupt which is contributing for the same purpose, for sending packets towards my CPU. Now the question here is, how we can tr troubleshoot this problem. We know that you know this is a lab setup. That's why we see a very small CPU, like 17% here. But in a normal production network where you have tons and, <laughs> sorry, not tons, megs or gigs of traffic going through the switch, you will definitely see a CPU utilization of around 80% to 100%. Now, how do I troubleshoot the problem? Now, I know that there are some packets which are going towards my CPU. Question is, is there any way to find out what packets are going towards my CPU? Well, there is one way. Let me show you what it is. So for that, what I need to do is I need to go back to my SP side. This is for the hybrid setup. So I press Control C thrice and I'm back into the SP side. And let me sh see the show module output. In the show module output, you'll see one very interesting thing that this MSFC2 is connected to the, to the SP via this module number 15 and slot number 1. Port number is also 1. This is basically a virtual port which is present at the backplane for connecting the SP CPU with the RP CPU. Now what I can do here is I can set up a span capture for this port 15 slash 1 and find out what packets are hitting my RP CPU. Let's see an example of a span capture. Okay, so here it's asking for mod module and the port number. The module here is 15, port number is one. Okay, so it would be 15 slash one and again, the destination interface. The destination interface is, a, is an interface where you have a PC with the Wireshark connected. So once I set up a span like this, then it will help me to capture all the packets which are going towards my RP CPU. Now what if I have a CPU utilization issue on my SP side? Let's check what's the CPU utilization on the SP CPU. So right now it's 1.12%. Hmm, okay. All right, now the question is, how can I spike up the CPU utilization on the SP side? Well, let me show you one interface here. On the SP side, I have a SC0 interface, which is used for management purpose. Imagine you have a 3750 switch or a 2960 switch. There by default, we have the VLAN one, which is used for management purpose. So similarly, on a 6500 in a hybrid setup, I have a SC0 interface, which is a virtual interface, which is used for a management purpose. So we can associate this interface with an IP, followed by a network mask, and obviously a VLAN, a VLAN information. So here in, in our case, what I've done here is I've assigned an IP of 10.10.4 to this SC0 interface. Now let me send some packets from the other two switches to this IP and see whether there is a spike in the CPU or not. Let me break this pink. Okay, let me send some pings to 10.10.4. Okay, now let's see what's the CPU utilization. Still 2.21%, not a high CPU. Let's run the command one more time. 64.74%, definitely it's going up.
Okay, now 48.64%. Again, so this gives us enough reason to troubleshoot the problem. So how we can take or how we can capture the packets which are going towards my SC0 interface? Well, let's see this. Let's look at the span uh, command one more time. In the same span command, I can create SC0 as my source interface. So if I'm creating uh, SC0 as my source interface, then I'll capture all the packets which are going towards my SC0 interface or going towards my SP CPU. Again, the command will look like this. And again, you have to specify a destination interface where a PC with the Wireshark is connected. Okay, cool. So what are the two tools, or what are the tools which I have on a SOUP1 or a SOUP2 running in a hybrid setup? Number one, if in case it's a RP CPU which is pegging, then I have to take a span capture on 15 slash one. In case it's a SP CPU which is having the problem, I have to take a span capture on the SC0 interface. Okay, so these are the two options which I have on a SOUP1 running in hybrid mode. Now let's move on to the next generation of the supervisor, that is SOUP2 running in native mode. It is possible that the SOUP2 can also run in a, in a hybrid mode, but for demonstration purpose, I have installed an iOS software in the SOUP2 soup, uh, soup here. So SOUP2 is running in native mode here. So let's have a look at the box. Okay, so what is the CPU utilization here? I guess it's again 0%. Yes, it is 0% here. So let's use the same trick and try to generate some traffic towards the CPU of SOUP2 running in native mode. The IP address is 10.10.3. .10 Number of packets is huge. Timeout is zero. Okay. All right. So let's see what's the CPU utilization now on the SOUP2 running native mode. Okay. It's going up. It was zero previously. Now it's 19% and 10% is contributed by the interrupt traffic. Again, uh, what are the tools which are available on this platform to find out what packets are going to the CPU? Before we answer that question, it's also important for us to understand what are the interfaces which are involved in sending traffic towards my CPU, how we can do that. Let's have a look at this command. I'm going to use CAPS for better visibility here. Okay. So I'm actually looking at the show interface output and I'm including everything which starts with line and has drops in it. So here in this output, please have a look at this VLAN 10 output. I'm looking at this input queue and apparently there is huge number of drops on this input queue. The question is what is input queue and why there are drops in this input queue? And if we look at it, the drops are incrementing. So this is another thing which you, need to, you should notice. The drop should increment. That indicates that we are constantly sending some packets towards the CPU. Okay, so coming back to our discussion, what is input queue? Now input queue, you can imagine as a software queue, which is present right before the RP CPU, where all the packets are waiting before they can be processed by the CPU. So in case there are a lot of packets which are waiting in that particular queue, what we're gonna do is we will we'll start tail dropping those packets. That is the time when you'll see this counter incrementing. Okay, fair enough. So we have identified this interface is one of the interface which is sending traffic towards my CPU. Now, how do we understand what traffic is going towards the CPU? Now there is a command which is available on this platform which can help us to take a dump of the packet which are waiting in this queue, in this particular input queue. Now that command is called the show buffer command. So let's see uh, the output of, of that command.
okay? So we are lucky to get an output here, but it sometimes might happen that you do not get any output when you execute this command. So that, that happens when there is no packet which are waiting in that queue at that moment of time when you executed the command. So if you type the commands once or twice or thrice, you should be able to get some output from this command, show buffer, input interface, VLAN 10, and then header. So what are the different fields in this output? I see the source and destination IP. I see what is the TTL value of the packet. I also see what's the protocol number of this packet. So looking at the source destination IP, I can backtrack and find out what is the ingress port from where it is coming and who is sending this traffic. Then we can refer to that list which I've shown for the possible causes of, of punting traffic to the CPU and find out why that CPU utilization or why the packet is going towards my CPU. So show buffer input interface is a tool which is available on soup2 running in native mode, which can give us an information about what traffic is going towards my CPU. Before that, we definitely need to identify the interface from where I'm sending the traffic using the show interface command. And you should be seeing input queue drops under the interface. All right, so we have covered soup1 running in hybrid mode, soup2 running in native mode. Now it's the time to look into soup720 or soup32. Okay. So before I start talking about uh, the tool which is available in Soup 720. I just want to show you the location where the soup is uh, or the tool is located in the Soup 720 architecture. So that way, it will be easier for us to understand uh, how the traffic is getting captured in that tool. So let me go back to my slides. And all the slides which I had before this slide are, uh, are all the backup slides. So let me have a, let me show you the si slides here. So these are the slides which contains the information from the CLI of the switch. And we have already seen this output on, on the CLI. Okay. All right. So, uh, the tool which is available in Soup 720 or Soup 32 is called the NetDriver tool. Now it's very important for us to understand where this NetDriver tool is located. And this will also give us an understanding how this NetDriver is actually capturing the packets. Now again, we are back on the Soup 720 architecture. And you see number one is where the packets are coming from the front panel port. Number two is the header which is sent towards my PFC. Number three is where PFC has received the packet. Number four, PFC has sent the result back towards my ingress line card. An ingress line card in number six is sending it towards my CPU through the, pinnacle, through the port ASIC, which is the Pinnacle ASIC here. There is a significance of this Pinnacle ASIC here, which we are going to see shortly. Okay. So the packet has reached number seven, and seven is the Mistral ASIC. Now we have the NetDriver tool right here after the Mistral ASIC. So when we are looking at this NetDriver tool, we are basically looking at what are the packets which are going to my RPCPU. Now here, when we look at the NetDR tool in the CLI, you will see that NetDR starts with a debug command. In iOS code SXF and later, we have a dedicated driver which is doing this functionality. So it is safe to run the debug NetDR output in iOS code later than SXF, and it's mainly built for troubleshooting high CPU utilization problem. But before SXF, a debug NetDR or this NetDR tool runs like any debug command, and you should be very careful while running this debug, debug NetDR output. Okay, so let's let's get get back to our uh, CLI again, and let's explore this NetDR tool on Soup 720. So I'm going to kill the pings here. Okay. All right. So first step again, I have to check what's the CPU utilization of Soup 720 here. 
Okay, it's zero percent. Excellent. So let's spike up the CPU utilization on the Soup 720 by sending some pings. The IP address of interface VLAN 10 here is 10.10.10.1. Now let's check the CPU utilization. Okay, so my CPU utilization is going high. And again, IP input is a process which is contributing to 12.47% of the CPU utilization. Now let's see uh, the debug output or the debug NetGear capture tool. So this is how we enable the debug NetGear capture. And these are the options which are available for, to us. There are a lot of options here, but I want to focus on this RX and the TX option. RX is for capturing the package which are going towards the CPU, and TX is for using or for capturing the package which are coming from the CPU. So this tool can also be used in, uh, in a scenario where you know we have configured EIGRP properly but the EIGRP neighborship is not coming up. Then what you'd like to do is you'd probably like to see whether I'm sending the EIGRP hello packet from the CPU or not. So you can co configure a debug NetGear capture in the TX direction and see whether the packets are actually coming from the CPU or not. So in this case, since I'm interested in capturing the packets going towards the CPU, I'm going to configure as RX. Okay. Excellent. So now my NetDR is capturing packets. Let's see how we can see this packet. Wow. Okay. So uh, one difference from show buffer input interface output is that show buffer input interface can only capture one packet at a time. However, if you look at the show NetDR capture output, it's capturing 4096 packets, and it's a cyclic buffer. And uh, you do not have to identify the ingress interface as well, which is contributing to the CPU spike. The interface in information is present right here. So if you want to see a trend in the interface which is sending the packets towards the CPU, you can probably use a very simple filter like this. So here in, in our case, I can see that all the packets hitting the CPU are coming from VLAN 10. Okay, all right. So let's see what are the different uh, fields which are present in the show NetGear capture output which are helpful to us. Okay, just like the show buffer input interface output, I can see the source destination IP, which gives us a good information who is sending this traffic. Second, I can see what's the source destination MAC. And uh, we can also see what's the protocol. As you can see that it's an ICMP packet. So obviously some user is trying to, you know, hammer my switch by sending some ping packets here. Okay, so these are the information which are of particular interest to us. The interface from where it is coming, the VLAN from where it's coming, again, it's VLAN 10. The protocol, what kind of packet it is, what's the source IP, what's the destination IP, was the destination MAC, was the source MAC. Now there is one very important information which can be obtained from the same output. But unfortunately, we, we cannot discuss this uh, in detail because the tools which we use to um, decode this is internal to Cisco. This is the field here, the source index and the destination index. The source index is basically telling me what's the physical interface from where I'm receiving this packet? Okay, all right. So I'm typing one command here which can give me the ingress interface from where I have received the packet.
It's probably coming from 5 slash 2. Let me see what's connected on 5 slash 2. Okay, my soup2 native is connected to my 5 slash 2. And I believe that this is a trunk interface which has VN10 in spanning tree forwarding state. That's correct, yes. So unfortunately, I cannot discuss anything further than this regarding this command, but just be informed that I have an information in the debug NetGear output which can give us uh, what is the physical port from where I have received the packet. Okay, so one more information which is uh, helpful here from this shown NetGear output is the destination index. So the destination index 380 is a well-known destination index, which tells me that all these packets are going towards my CPU. Okay, all right. So now, now that we know that NetDR is available on this platform, sometimes it's really become difficult for us to troubleshoot in case it's a very complicated scenario with this information only. Because as you can see that this debug NetGear output doesn't really give me the entire packet. It only gives me the header of the packet. So when we need to troubleshoot a very complicated scenario where we need to understand the entire data part and the entire header, then we need something like a pan capture. Now, do we have an option like that? Yes, we do. So we have a span capture which is available on this supervisor only after 12.119E. It's called the RPSP in band span. So that will be a regular span capture which will help us to identify what are the packets which are hitting the CPU. Now, the commands for the span capture is different in SXH onwards. Since this uh, SOUP720 is running SXI, these are the commands which are used for configuring that RP or SP in band span. Let me show you that. Okay, so I'm configuring a local span. The session number is one. And let me see what are the options which are available inside this span. I can specify the source, I can specify the destination. Okay, so what is available after source? Okay, it looks like the CPU is available after so source. Okay, which CPU? Is it RP CPU or SP CPU? Let's for an example, in my case, I pick up RP CPU. Which direction? TX, RX? both. I'll give you the answer now, and in, in my next slide, I'm going to explain you where this RP in, SP in band span is located, then it would be easier for you to understand the direction of the span. However, the answer is TX. We'll see it in detail why it's TX and not RX. Finally, I have to do a no shot. All right. So let me see what's my span configuration. Okay, as you can see that I made a mistake. I have not configured a destination interface. So the command is monitor session one, type local, source CPU, you can specify the CPU which you want, and finally the direction in which you want to take the capture. Okay, so I'll make this complete. I'll configure a destination interface. Mm, number one slash one maybe. What's the interface we have? Five slash one, okay. Cool. All right, so the entire command will look something like this. Source CPU, destination in phase, gig 5 slash 1. All right, so the same RPSP in band span can be configured in a different way in a code which is not running SXH uh, and onwards. So how do we do it? First of all, what we need to identify is a, an interface, a physical interface, which is in shutdown state. 
So let me go ahead and shut down interface gig 2 slash 1. Okay, 2 slash 1 is in shutdown state. Then I'll configure a regular span session. And th the source of my span session would be the interface which I have, uh, which, which is in shutdown state. And the destination interface would be the interface having the PC with the Wireshark connected. Okay, so once I've done this, what I need to do is I need to log on to the SP CPU. Let's see how we can log on to the SP CPU. I have to give a remote login switch command. So I'm in the SP CPU, as you can see here. Then I have to give this command. And the session number is the same session number which I've used for in the RP CPU. And then I have to do add. After that, I can specify which CPU I want to span. Is it RP or the SP CPU? Let's, for an example, I take RP in band. Finally, it will ask me for the direction of the span. Again, I'll choose TX. Now, let's see, uh, let's see in the slides why did we choose TX and not RX. Where is this located? So these are the commands which are available in SXH. These are commands which we need to configure in case it's running SXF. This is the SOUP 720 architecture presentation again. I mean, uh, this is the diagram of SOUP 720 architecture, and I have only copied that part of the output which shows the MSFC daughter card and the Pinnacle ASIC. Now what we're doing here is we're taking the span capture on the Pinnacle ASIC. And the direction of the span is from the perspective of the Pinnacle ASIC. So when I'm configuring a TX span, I'm basically configuring or trying to capture packets which are going from the Pinnacle ASIC towards my CPU. In case of a RX span, I'll be capturing the packets which are coming from the CPU towards my Pinnacle ASIC. So the direction for RPSP in band span is different from uh, your NetDR capture. So in NetDR capture, RX is for capturing packets towards the CPU, and TX uh, for capturing packets coming from the CPU. Okay, all right. So now that we have an understanding of the different tools which we have uh, on the different kinds of setup uh, available on 6500, let's see what are the sequence of steps in troubleshooting a high CPU utilization issue. First of all, as I said, that in case it's a 70, uh, in case it's a spike in the CPU, we need not be concerned and we did not troubleshoot the problem. In case it's a constant CPU utilization, that's the time when it, we need to be bothered. The first thing we need to identify is whether it's a CPU utilization issue because of process switching or interrupt switching. So in case it's a process uh, which is actually spiking the CPU, then we need to be troubleshooting why that process is involved. For an example, let's say that you are trying to troubleshoot an EIGRP, or you see that EIGRP process is pegging the CPU. Then the troubleshooting would be probably to find out whether the routing table is, get, is uh, properly converged because of EIGRP or not, or whether the EIGRP, there are some neighbors which are stuck inactive or not. In most of the customer scenarios, what we see is we see high CPU is caused because of interrupt switching. The first step in uh, troubleshooting those kind of scenarios are to identify the packets which are causing the CPU. So in SOUP1 or SOUP2 running in hybrid mode, I have the span capture for 15 slash 1 and S0, depending on where the CPU utilization is, to find out what packets are hitting the CPU. In SOUP2, I have the show buffer output, which will help me to identify the packets which are in the CPU. And in SOUP720, I have the net driver output or net driver capture, which can help me to capture the packets going towards the CPU. 
After 12.119 E code, I have the RPSP in band span, which, which can take a normal scan, a span of the packets which are going towards the CPU. But the commands are different in SXF and SXH code. So once we have identified the packets which are going to the CPU, the next step would be to find out what are the reasons behind that punt. Now again, you can refer to slide 13, which has a list of most frequent causes of CPU utilization. However, as I said, the list is not exhaustive. There could be scenarios uh, where, the, uh, where the packets are punted to the CPU because of um, you know, a platform limitation or things like that. Now, there could be some scenarios where you might need to understand what is causing a spike in the CPU utilization. Then what you can do is you can probably try to run a script like this. This is an example of an EEM script. Now, what we're doing in this script is we are trying to monitor this SNMP OIT. This SNMP OIT is for checking what's the CPU utilization in last one minute. And the script will get triggered once the CPU utilization goes beyond 70%. And it will stop automatically once it comes down beyond 20%. When the, st when the script is getting triggered, it will throw out an error me or a message, a syslog message, saying that high CPU is detected. And it will also try to collect the output of the following command, show clock, show proc CPU sorted. And will store this output in a file named high, C high underscore cpu.txt and store it in the flash. You can go on adding the commands depending on your requirement with this EM script. So with that, I, I'd like to thank you for listening to this and I am done with the presentation and I'll move, move on and I'll pass on the control to Satish. Satish, please take over. Thank you. Okay, so here are some of the references. Uh, so the PDF format has this all the all the links that you can refer to. It's also posted in the chat window. And before we start with the Q and A, we have one last polling question. The question is, how useful was this presentation? The options are, uh, this was very informative presentation and will help me during my day to day 6500 high CPU utilization issues. Option B, this presentation needed more in-depth details. And option C, I wanted to see some information on configuration. Option D, this presentation was somewhat useful. And option E, this presentation was not useful to me. So please record your responses. The poll is activated on the right-hand side. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Shavik. It was a great presentation combined with a real uh, life scenario uh, uh, demo. So I uh, really appreciate that. And no, also thank you everyone for participating in the uh, you know, event polling. Uh, we'll uh, shortly see the poll number three results. And uh, okay, so few more uh, seconds to go for the polling result three. While that mm -hmm. comes up, uh, now it's time to answer some of the questions that our viewers have submitted today. Uh, by the way, if you can't stay with us for the Q&A, please be sure to click on the evaluation link and that will be provided in the chat window to let us know how this session met your business needs and expectation. And uh, we appreciate your feedback. Uh, the first five listeners to complete the evaluation survey will receive a $1.20 uh, gift card. To complete the evaluation, please click on the link provided. Uh, I think it's in the chat window. And uh, okay. And also, um, uh, you know, later uh, uh, Savik will be answering uh, uh, the questions uh, through uh, Ask the Expert event, which will be run in the Cisco Support Community. So let's take uh, uh, the question. Uh, Shavik, the first question is, yep. if we have an issue with uh, CAT 6500 in VSS mm -hmm. and bro broadcast coming from a checkpoint cluster, okay. due to this, there is a high CPU on the CAT 6500. The mm -hmm. question is, is there any way to drop broadcast traffic and do not make it go to the control plane? 
Oh, well, that's a very good question here. And we have been really facing these challenges uh, in the recent past where we see that a lot of broadcasts which are hitting the CPU. So we try to identify the different options which are available here. Now, it depends totally on what kind of broadcast it is. So the first choice which we have here is, you know, implement storm control on the interfaces on all the access layer switches so that we can save the CPU from, you know, the, in case there is, a, uh, there is a broadcast storm. Now we had this uh, COPP policies or, you know, COP policies which we could implement in a code 12.2 SXF and before, but we deprecated that feature in the later version of the code. The reason being it was actually conflicting with other, you know, uh, main function of iOS. That's why we had to deprecate that functionality. Now there is one more option which is there. In case it's an R protocol, which is or R broadcast, which is hitting the CPU, then there are in fact two options. What you can do is there is a MLSQS protocol R uh, command which is there along with the MLSQS, which will rate limit the pa the R packets in the hardware. And also you can use the IP DHCP snooping option along with our inspection and configure a rate limit to that our inspection value, which will somewhat reduce the R packets going to the CPU. Now there is a drawback for these two features. Uh, the, the, the main drawback is uh, both the features are system wide. So what happens is when you implement this two feature, there might be a possibility that normal broadcast packet or normal our expected R protocol packets are also getting dropped. So the option would be to implement storm control and that is what we are recommending uh, to our customers now. So I hope that answers the questions. So Satish, can I have the Thank next you. question? Yep. Yeah, so the next question is 30% of CPU constantly mm -hmm. and uh, the, the process uh, history, uh, you know, that's the uh, number which looks like. So if it's a 30% of CPU constantly increasing, could we mm -hmm. classify that as an issue? Well, again, it totally depends on the benchmark. So ideally, in case that you have a constant CPU utilization of around 30%, you would be first interested to know what packets are hitting the CPU. Now, if those packets are related with some particular application, then there is nothing much we can do about it, and we have to take that as a benchmark in your network. However, those traffics are not really required in the network, then we can probably go ahead and implement some kind of policy or some kind of ACL to block those traffic. So uh, to answer your question, it will totally depend on what kind of traffic is hitting the CPU and whether that is required for your network or not. Okay, thank you. The next question is, could we use an ELAM to get specific traffic, uh, traffic to the CPU? Or is this for data plane only? Uh, I, that's that's a very good question. So ELM is again a tool which is available for internal Cisco, and you you would need tax to run those commands and run that tool. But to answer that question, whether ELAM can be used for capturing packets which are bound to the CPU or not, answer is yes. We can use ELAM to find what traffic are going towards the CPU. Okay, great. And uh, uh, there are a few other questions as well. So in an ideal situation, what should mm -hmm. be the CPU utilization of my, of, uh, my switch? Ideally, when your network protocol has converged, then you should see a CPU utilization of around 0% or maximum 10%, not more than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is, how do I take a capture for the packets punted to the MSFC? in case there is a redundant supervisor? So in case there is a redundant supervisor, uh, uh, what we have here is only one soup will be in active state, meaning one soup will be taking all the decision. So you won't see a high CPU utilization on a redundant supervisor. Uh, you will probably see the high CPU on the, on the active supervisor only. So whatever supervisor is active, that, uh, that is what we have to troubleshoot, and there is where we have to use the tools which we have discussed to find out what packets are hitting the CPU. Okay, great. The next question is, what is the impact of enabling debug NetDR on the switch? What is the okay. impact? 
Yes, so uh, I think we have already covered this in the presentation. Um, in case you're running a code 12.2 SXF and later, there is no impact in running the debug NetGear capture. However, if you're running a, a code which is before that, then it will run as a normal debug. So yeah, there will be an impact or, on the CPU utilization, and it's not really recommended to run a debug NetGear capture in, in code SXF and uh, before. So um, uh, it, unless you have a console access, we would not really recommend to run this debug capture. But it, after SXF, it's absolutely safe to run this debug NetGear capture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, is that possible to check forwarding plane utilization for each line card? Ah, that's, a, that's a good question. So I think the question is uh, whether we can expect to see a high CPU utilization on the DFC enabled line card or not. Well, uh, the DFC enabled line card has a CPU, but that is not used for maintaining any control plane protocol. So that is mainly used for diagnostic purpose, and that CPU is used for responding back to my supervisor. So in case the supervisor is asking some queries or you know some polling, uh, it, in case it's doing some kind of polling towards the line card, then that CPU is used for answering those polling requests. Now you might see a CPU utilization on the line card, but that has nothing to do with the network traffic as such. So it's used for internal uh, management of the line card and the system. So you need not be concerned. You get in touch with TAC. It could also possible, we have seen in some scenarios in the past where you see CPU utilization on a DFC enabled line card only, but not on supervisor. And few scenarios were attributed because of the fact of an iOS bug or a software bug, uh, which triggered the problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Um, would there be an increase in CPU utilization if we have an EEM script running? No, so again, EEM is a, a specific tool which is again available after a certain version of the iOS code. I strongly recommend to refer the feature navigator tool which is available with the Cisco.com. And there you can check from where you, we have started supporting the EEM. But as such, since we have a specific driver which is doing the EEM functionality, we should not see any high CPU utilization because of EEM running at the background. Okay. Uh, the next question is, do we have a similar span capture for uh, Supervisor 2 running in native mode? Uh, well, uh, I, when we're talking about the span capture, I think we're talking about the RPS pin band span. Uh, well, the answer is yes. Depending on what iOS you're running, it is possible to uh, configure the span capture. But in iOS SXF and uh, later, the command is different. Whereas uh, uh, when you're using an iOS like 12.1.19e or SXF, then the command will be uh, will be a little different. I'd recommend to refer the slides to get the exact command lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Why TTL, val why TTL value becomes 1 during multicasting on 720, which in turn causes high CPU? Okay, so again, it depends on what kind of network we are dealing with. Now, the TTL value of 1 should not become, uh, TTL value should not become 1 at any point of the time. So in case it is becoming 1, that's the time uh, we can assume that, you know, there is some kind of looping which is happening in the network because of which I'm reducing the TTL value. Uh, so that is probably not an issue with high CPU, but more of an issue with multicast and find out, and we need to find out in case there is a loop in the network which is causing the TTL to go down. Or it is also possible we have seen some application and because of a bug in that application, uh, the package uh, comes with a TTL value of one right from the source. And uh, since uh, we are not supposed to forward the packet when the TTL value becomes 1. What we do is we drop the packet and send an ICMP unreachable back to the source. Now, this ICMP unreachable can only be sent by, this, uh, by the CPU. That is the reason we make a punt to the pack, uh, to, towards, the CP, uh, towards the CPU. So TTL value becoming 1 and high CPU because of that, 
ICP is probably a symptom of it, but the problem is TTL going into one, which is maybe because of a loop in the network. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. The next question is, how can we reduce the process for SSH on 6500? Okay, all right. So when you see that SSH process is going high, uh, are you specifying about the virtual exec? So if it's a virtual exec, that's, uh, that is a process which is used for, uh, you know, servicing the VTY lines. So when we are trying to log into the switch, then I'm going to use the VTY lines to log into the switch. So I'll do a telnet or SSH over those VTY lines. And if I try to dump a huge output over those VTY lines, maybe a show tech output or a show run output, it is expected to see that the CPU utilization will go high because of those uh, in, in the virtual exact process. So it's an expected behavior, and I don't think that should be a matter of concern here. Okay. The next question is, any dependency on of iOS for capturing process utilization, and if such processes are not identified, will it be seen as spikes on CPU utilization? Could you, could you please repeat the question? I'm not sure whether I got the question right or not. Sure. The question is, any dependency of iOS for capturing process utilization, and if such processes are not identified, mm -hmm. will it be seen as spikes on CPU utilization? Okay, all right. So um, in case I do a show proc CPU out, uh, command and I see that CPU utilization is, let's say, 100% because of some process or because of process switching, then there will be some process which is going 100%. So I think when you do a show proc CPU output, if there is a, if there, the CPU utilization is high because of process switching, there will be one process which will be associated with that. In case you do not see a process which is causing the CPU to go high, but you still see that the CPU is high because of process switching, then that's probably a bug in the iOS code. We have seen some recent issues on a 3750 device where we do show proc CPU, uh, show proc CPU command, and we see the CPU utilization is around 90% because of process switching, but there is no process as such which is causing that hundred, uh, the CPU to go to 90%. So if you do not see any process listed or any process which can be identified which is causing the CPU to go high because of process switching, then that's probably a bug in the iOS code. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Savik, uh, there is a follow-up question on the previous uh, SSH. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, the SSH is taking 40% of CPU process. Is there a mm -hmm. way to reduce it? Uh, again, since it's a SSH process, I think we need to look into it from the security perspective. So it could be a problem with certificate generation or um, you know, maybe something which is wrong with the SSH here. So I'd recommend that you, you need to get in touch with our security team to find out what is particularly in the SSH process which is causing the CPU to go high. So once we understand why it's going high, then only we can probably recommend what are the different steps to reduce that uh, SSH process or CPU utilization due to SSH process. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, that is, if the CPU utilization is high as 90%, when we use the debug netdr command, will not it increase the utilization further by checking on the interfaces? Well, if you're running SXFN later, it's absolutely safe to run a debug net capture uh, command because we have a dedicated tool which is, uh, which is actually capturing this packet and not related to the RP or the SP CPU. So it will not cause the CPU utilization to go high in case you're using any iOS after SXF. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few more uh, questions. Since we have the time, I'll take the, those one as well. So sure. Do Do we have a CPU on the LC running DSC? Do we see a high CPU utilization on the LCs running DSC as, as well? 
Yeah, I think we have already answered this question. Yes, uh, there is a CPU on the line card running DFC, and that CPU is mainly used for uh, communicating with the supervisor. So it's not related with forwarding uh, the packet through the line card. It's mainly related with a management of the line card inside the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, there's one more question uh, related to span. How do we determine the direction of the in-band span? Yes, I think we have a slide for that. Let me go back to the slide. Okay. You can tell me the number. Because I yes, definitely. I think it's slide number 30, which explains what should be the direction of the span. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it would be the TX span. We have to choose a TX direction. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'll take one last question. Mm -hmm. If I upgrade my supervisor from SOUP2 to SOUP720 or 32, can mm -hmm. I expect to see a difference in CPU utilization? Well, no. The problem here is there are packets which are not able, which we are not able to uh, support in the hardware, and that is the reason we are seeing it in the CPU. Now, as far as you might see, actually, the answer is yes and no. So in the later version of the CPU, what we have done here is we have actually increased the capacity of the hardware accelerated engine. Now, if the CPU punt was because of some hardware limitation, which got you know fixed in the later version of the supervisor, then you might see an improvement in the CPU utilization if you upgrade from SOUP32 to SOUP720 for, for an example. However, if the CPU utilization was because of some broadcast, as we discussed in the beginning, then whether you use a SOUP720 or a SOUP32, the packet will still get punted to the CPU and will create a high CPU utilization. So depending on what caused the CPU utilization, uh, we need to see whether you know upgrading the supervisor will help here or not. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, Sovik, I have one more question. Uh, sure. Uh, since we have the time. What is mm -hmm. the best way to baseline the traffic in a network in order to implement hardware base rate limiters or COPP? Mm -hmm. um, well, these are two different things. Again, it depends on, uh, see, for uh, hardware rate limiters, not all hardware rate limiters are available. So the hardware rate limiters are available only for spe specific features. Now, in case you cannot classify the hardware rate limiters, um, or you cannot classify the packets inside the hardware rate limiter, then we have to fall back to the COPP and define our own policies. But hardware rate limiter is always recommended because the, the place where I am dropping the packet. When I'm using the hardware rate limiters, I'm actually dropping the packet right at the PFC. But when I'm using the COPP, that is not done in the hardware. That is probably done in the software. So the packet has to go from the PFC towards my CPU, and in between the packets will get dropped. So obviously, if the hardware rate limiter is available for the cost for which I'm seeing a punt to the CPU, then we'll recommend to do hardware rate limiter to stop the traffic going to the CPU. Otherwise, in case we do not have a hardware rate limiter, we have to fall back to COPP. Now, the question again would be whether you really want to drop the traffic or not. Sometimes it becomes important for us to pass on few traffics which are required by some application in the network. However, those traffic we know will not be supported by hardware in our Catalyst 6500 switch. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that concludes the Q&A portion of today's event. So as I said before, Sovic will be hosting an Ask the Expert event which will be starting today, January 17th, until January 27th. If you have additional questions, log on to Cisco Support Committee and click on the Experts Corner tab at the top. Uh, Shavik will continue answering your questions through the community site over the next two weeks. If you haven't explored the Cisco Support Committee yet, please take a moment to check out the excellent resource that is available today. In the, uh, the address is supportforums.cisco.com. And uh, we invite you to attend our next CSE Expert Series webcast with uh, uh, Joe Martinez, CCI in RNS, 
and uh, Matthew Ronkowski, who is CCI Invoice. The topic will be Unified Computing System, UCS version 2.0, new hardware and software features. It will take place on Tuesday, February 7th at 8 a.m. Pacific time, which will be 4 p.m. Paris time. The registration URL uh, is mentioned here on the slide and uh, that will be posted on the chat window. And uh, would like to inform you about our uh, another uh, offering, uh, the webcast in Spanish with routing and switch switching CCI, Ricardo Prado. The topic will be BGP path control. It will take place on uh, Tuesday, January 31st at 7 a.m. Pacific time, which is 9 a.m. Mexico City time. The registration URL will be posted in the chat window. It's available also on the slide. There is another webcast uh, coming up uh, if you speak Portuguese. That is with uh, Walter Pereira. The topic would be Cisco Airport Email Security Technology. It will take place on Tuesday, February 14th at 1.30 p.m. Rio de Janeiro time, 3.30 p.m. Wet Lisbon or 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. The link is available in the chat window as well as on the slide. So if you speak uh, any of these languages, Polish, Japanese, Portuguese, or Spanish, we invite you to ask your questions and collaborate in your language. We are also running a pilot for Russian and you can register at the mentioned link also in the chat window and the presentation. And we invite you to ask questions and collaborate in the Cisco Support Committee via the available social media channels. That's uh, like Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, um, and uh, LinkedIn. So feel free to explore those as well. Okay, so thank you so much, Savik, and uh, the technical panelists, Amit, Ranganatha, and Akshay, for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.